Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to First Ave today. So good that you are with us, that you've chosen to join with us. It's great to be back. I've been off for about six weeks. Part of that time was some health things, but I feel great and glad to be here today. This is actually Pentecost Sunday, and while we're not specifically speaking about the Holy Spirit, we need to constantly remind ourselves that Pentecost is more than a day. Pentecost is something we experience every day in the power of the Holy Spirit, and that the Holy Spirit is present to be at work in our lives, to be at work through our lives, and everything we do needs to be empowered by His Spirit if it's going to have any success at all. So I want you to keep that in mind. As we get to the end of this, this message this morning, I'm going to ask you to join me, and we'll describe that later, but in asking God by His Holy Spirit to be at work in our lives in powerful ways moving forward. We're starting a new series today. It's based on the book of Philippians, and I've been excited for weeks to be able to get started and to share in this. The series is called Servants and Saints. And we're going to take about seven weeks to work our way through the book of Philippians. Let me just read the first few verses and then we'll make some comments and then dive right in. Philippians 1 verses 1 to 6. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. How many of you have ever lived in a foreign country? Uh, I don't just mean visited like a two-week vacation, but I mean actually lived for a period of time. If you have, why don't you just respond in that chat and just type in the name of the country that you lived. Now, for some of you, Canada may be your foreign country, and your home country is somewhere else. And you can put that country in there as well, just to kind of let us know where everyone is from this morning. The closest thing to living in a foreign country that my wife and I have ever done is a couple of winters ago, we spent two months down in Phoenix, Arizona. We went for the sunshine and the warmth and and, uh, just to get away, but we found very quickly that things were different. The U.S. is very much like us. They're our closest neighbors, and, and in many ways we think we're the same, but once you're there for a little while, you realize that you're in a different country. The money is different, the food is different, the costs of things, medical care is different. There's lots of things that are different, and they drive really fast on those big freeways. But but living in a foreign country is, is quite an experience for us. And even though you may never have lived in a in a literal foreign country, as Christians, doesn't it feel sometimes like you live in a foreign country? Maybe the place that you work is so different than, than the place where you live. Maybe the language is different. Maybe the, the, the atmosphere is different. Maybe the way people treat each other is different. The environments are different. All of those things are different. And, and when you walk through the door of that place where you work, you sometimes feel like you are walking into a foreign country or foreign land. I think when we look at this book of Philippians, Paul is really talking to believers about that very thing, about the fact that that we as believers enter into a world that at times feels incredibly foreign to us. And my big question over these next number of weeks is how do we live out our faith in a foreign land? in a setting that is far removed from what we value or hold as important, in a setting which is so foreign to what we desire and believe. Hey, I've played hockey. I played in a night league with all these guys that were business people in town. Walked into the dressing room. Boy, the language was like we were living in a different country. The attitudes were like we lived in a different country. Great guys! 
but it was like walking into a place that was totally different than where I had ever been before. So let me dive into Philippians. We're going to just give some background today, an introduction using these first six verses, and, and quickly set the stage. So here's some background information for you. First of all, the author, and we're pretty confident, the author is the, the Apostle Paul. Uh, he was a Pharisee, but in Acts chapter 9, he had this amazing conversion experience. The road to Damascus, he was riding uh, on a, a donkey or something. He got thrown to the ground. He saw a bright light from heaven. God spoke to him, and, and he turned his life around. God turned Paul's life around, and he ends up writing a large portion of the New Testament. With him while he's writing is, is Timothy. And, and Timothy is a young apprentice or, or an intern in the faith. He's with Paul as he writes this letter to the Philippian believers. Paul is actually in, in prison while he writes this. He, he is somewhere where he doesn't want to be. But the reality is that this is where he is and he writes to these believers. The church at Philippi was started as the result of a vision that Paul had in Acts chapter 16, verse 9. In a vision, Paul sees a man from Macedonia who is pleading with him, come over to Macedonia and help us. Paul had wanted to go somewhere else and was trying to go there, but the Holy Spirit led him to Macedonia. If you want to kind of get a, a recap of what happens in Macedonia, uh, Lydia was one of the first converts there. The young girl who brought uh, profit to her owners through fortune, teller was delivered, fortune telling was delivered there. Paul and his traveling companion Silas, and this may be the most common story we know of, Paul and his traveling companion Silas were imprisoned but as they worshipped God at midnight, there was an earthquake and the prison bars were broken open and, and the jailer wanted to kill himself because he thought everybody had escaped. And, and instead, Paul led the jailer to Christ and him and his whole family were baptized there. Now, some years later, as I said, Paul from prison writes this letter. He was probably in Rome uh, when he was in prison, and he wrote this letter back to the church to encourage them as they live out their faith in a place that's not very receptive to the gospel. The time of writing, probably about 60 to 62 AD, although I'm not sure that that's all that important, but, but if we want to sort of figure out the, the date thing, it's about 30 years um, after the death of Jesus. And there are a number of themes in, in this book as well. Um, it's written to be read as a letter, not as a book. So it's not, like, it's not really meant to read one chapter a day, kind of as, as, you go through, as you would go through a regular book. It's meant to be written like a letter where you would sit down and read the whole thing at once. And I would encourage you, if you haven't read Philippians lately, Sit down some time with about a half hour, 45 minutes or so, and just read through the whole thing. Read it like a letter instead of like a book. But there's lots of themes there. We could talk about joy or rejoicing 11 times. The word rejoice or joy are used in this letter. And uh, Paul talks to them about the importance of rejoicing. Really interesting in light of the fact he's writing it from a prison or from captivity. So that's an interesting place we could go. He writes a lot about the character of God, about God being our Father, our source of grace, that he's revealed in Jesus, that he's come to bring us peace, or that he sent Jesus to come bring us peace. We could pursue that theme of the character of God. But there's also a lot in here about suffering for the sake of Christ. And that may not be as an exciting a study for us. We'll talk a little bit about that next week. But suffering for the sake of Christ. Suffering is part of the believer's life. And Paul writes about that in this book. But I want to pursue this idea of living in a foreign land or a foreign place. So let's get into it. The second point this morning is servants and saints. Um, Paul addresses this group of believers in his introductory verse with this idea of being servants and saints. Paul and Timothy 
are bond servants, that's in Philippians 1 1, of Jesus Christ to all of the saints in Christ Jesus. We don't think of ourselves often as servants, and probably we think of ourselves even less as saints. We're kind of shy about using some of those words. But the reality is that we are both. And let me just share with you a little bit about what Paul says. First of all, as servants, and Paul begins by describing himself in this manner. But notice he is a servant of Jesus Christ. He's not just a servant there to serve the people, to get them water and coffee and, you know, a cookie and whatever else that they might need or to do their housework. Paul says very specifically that he is a servant of Jesus Christ. And in all that he has done, he continue and continues to do for the church in Philippi, he understands that he is a servant of Christ first. He is here to serve this church. He is here to minister to them. He is here to care for them. They are not there to care for him. He is there to seek to care for them. Jesus says this same thing about himself when he write, or when he speaks, and we read it in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus picked up the towel, he took the basin, he washed the disciples' feet. A job that was normally kept for the lowest servant in the household. The most menial task, the most unpleasant task. And Jesus took that on himself. In a couple of weeks, we will talk more about this idea uh, of Jesus taking the form of a servant. And it's really what we need to model our lives after. We, We need to learn what it is to serve. We like to be in charge. If, if you really get down to it, our, our preference is kind of to be in charge, to give the orders, to be the boss, to have others do the dirty work, to um, pick the best jobs. But Paul learned this idea for himself, and it's a tough lesson to learn, but it's necessary for all of us. We're not here to be the boss. We're here to be the servant, enabling others through our serving to become everything God calls them forward to become. This isn't about me. This isn't about you. Sorry. This is about how we, in the power of the Holy Spirit and with the help of God, can minister and serve others to help them. And so if you teach children, or if you lead worship, or if you preach, or if you uh, are on staff, or if you're on the board, or if you operate a camera, or you play an instrument, the place we all need to come from is from this place of serving, of being willing to lay down our lives in order to serve others. Then he goes to the other one, saints. He calls them saints, and some translations use the the words holy people. Maybe we're more comfortable with that, but even that might make some of us uncomfortable. But, But being holy doesn't mean being perfect, but it means being set apart for the purposes of God. It means that that we are not ordinary, we are not common, we are not run-of-the-mill, we're not meant to be like everybody else. The, The phrase, you know, well, everybody else is doing it. We're not meant to do what everybody else is doing. I uh, took two two mission trips to Russia in in the year 2000, and then again in 2001. And they have these amazing Orthodox churches over there, the big domes. And uh, if you've ever been in one of them, they're they're incredible. And uh, when we went into them, this one particular, it was over a thousand years old. We think in Canada, if, if something's a hundred years old, that boy, that's really old. This church was over a thousand years old. And uh, so we, we, we went into that church and we, we spent some time there. And in the church, over off to the side, are these, these rectangular boxes, large rectangular boxes. And we sort of said, like, what, what is that over there? And, and our guides said, well, those are caskets, and inside those caskets are saints. 
Well, we don't have any of that in our church here. We don't believe in dead saints. We, we prefer living saints. And, uh, but, but all of us are described in scripture, scripture as saints, as people who are set apart for the purposes of God, as not ordinary people, but as holy people, people that have been committed to serving God and to living for the purpose of God. Now, that's not something we lord over each other. We don't introduce ourselves and say, hi, I'm St. Al. It's something that we wear humbly and something that we understand is the result of God being at work in us. It is not the result of our own doing. It is not the result of us having accomplished something or a certain level that we get to or status that we have in our church or in our society or anything like that. It's something that God sort of bestows on us. When we come to Christ, whether we are brand new Christians or we've been Christians for 40 years, the Bible Bible describes us as God's holy people, as saints. And so Paul, when he writes this book of Philippians, he says, to the saints which are at Philippi, God's people, the ones set apart. You may be living in a foreign land, but you belong to God. You're his holy people. Now, when, when we see ourselves as saints, it, it, it really does something significant to us. It influences how we live. It influences how we conduct ourselves. It influences how we use our resources. Understanding that we are set apart for God's purposes impacts who we marry, how we spend our time and money. It impacts us what we read, listen to, or watch. We are saints, holy people, set apart for God. Think about that for a while as you, you contemplate this idea that, that this letter is written to saints like you and I, holy people, set apart for the purposes of God. Let's move on. Number three, in Christ at Philippi. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, to all of the saints in Christ at Philippi. Here's where part of this idea of Philippians comes from. This sounds straightforward when we look at it, but, but Paul is writing to people who live in Philippi, right? Yes, but he's writing to people in Christ who live in Philippi. It may be something that you say, well, that's just splitting hair. No, it's not really. Their primary residence is not in Philippi. Their primary residence as believers is in Christ. The place they live first and foremost is in Christ and then in Philippi. And for you, your primary residence is not Chilliwack or, or Agassiz or, uh, you know, any place close by here. Your primary residence as a follower of Jesus Christ is first of all in Philippi, and then in Chilliwack, or whatever community you live in. There's kind of this interesting historical perspective here, if you want to look at it. In, in the time of the New Testament, Rome was the dominant political power in all of the Middle Eastern region. And often when they would conquer a city or a region, they would send Roman citizens, retired military personnel, into the area for the purpose of establishing Roman customs and culture in the region. These people would go there and they would live like Romans and act like Romans and conduct themselves like Romans. And so Paul picks up on this idea. He suggests that we as believers are in a foreign environment. We are in a place that is not comfortable or familiar to us. But at the same time, we are to go into that place and bring a different culture. We are to bring the culture of Christ into that place. Now, we have to be careful about something. We're not called to Christianize a place. And by that I mean, you know, try to get everybody to act like Christians, whether they are or not. You know, we, we, we prefer that. We like our governments to pass laws that, that favor Christians so that we don't feel so uncomfortable. You know, we're not supposed to get a whole bunch of non-Christians to act like Christians just so that we feel better. No, rather we are, we are to be part of this world, this foreign land that we are living in with the purpose of representing Christ 
They represented Rome. We represent Christ in this place. And we seek to bring people to Christ in order that they may experience genuine conversion and transformation and so that they too can live in Christ in Chilliwack or wherever it is that they live. What would happen if, if we first of all lived all lived in Christ. Some of that is what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks. But let me give you a bit of a spoiler alert. Our relationships would be impacted if we first of all lived in Christ. Our attitudes would be changed if we first of all lived in Christ. Our minds would be renewed. We would learn true contentment. And having that happen in us first would say so much more to the world around us than often the words that we try to use to speak to them about who we are. So they are in Christ Jesus at Philippi, and we are in Christ Jesus at Chilliwack. Let's move on. The greeting, grace and peace, Philippians 1, 2. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, first of all, grace is God at work in us. This includes everything that God does in us, from drawing us to himself, saving us, enabling us to be transformed into the image of Christ. We cannot do any of these things by ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit to be at work in us so that we can experience the grace of God. Grace comes from God, our Father, and through the Lord Jesus Christ, Paul begins and ends this short letter with grace. Grace is one of the themes of this book, as I said earlier. And we find it here, uh, particularly he says in his greeting, grace and peace. This is much more than Paul just saying hello. You know how you write in your letter, uh, dear so-and-so, I hope you're doing well. This is more than Paul just saying, I hope you're doing well. He says, may you know the grace of God in your life. And then he goes on to peace. And peace is the result of God's grace. Pastor Gavin, a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago when he preached on heaven, um, he talked to us about this idea of peace. And I wrote down, this down. It's not a quote, but it's a takeaway. Peace is internal calmness when there is chaos all around us. That's kind of fitting for the, the world we're living in right now, the foreign land we're living in right now, isn't it? For some of us, we're really stressed out because about COVID-19 and about all of the isolation and, and distancing and all of those things. And, and, and I understand that there are a lot of people that are fi- seeking help because of the anxiety that they are experiencing and feeling. But Paul calls on them to give thanks, to pray, to not be anxious, to experience the grace of God that results in the peace of God coming into their lives. Verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 of Philippians And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. When the grace of God is at work in us, the peace of God is the result in us. Let me move to the last part of this, number five, a promise. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, very common verse to many people. But if you've never heard it before, here it is being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Through Paul, God makes this incredible promise to us that is that, that in the midst of everything that is going on around us, even when we feel we are living in a foreign land, even when the circumstances are different than we would like them to be, Even when there's a virus running rampant through the world, even when we struggle, even when some of us have lost our jobs and we we sympathize with you, even when all of those things have happened, even when you have to homeschool your kids and you can hardly wait for them to go back to the classroom, even when we can't gather together in the church like we normally do, even when... There's this promise that God, 
who has begun a good work in us will keep on working in us. Even when it's hard, even when we would rather be in a different time and place, God has promised that he will keep on being at work by the power of his Holy Spirit. This is why the Holy Spirit is so important in everyday life. By the power of his Holy Spirit, he will be at work in us and he will accomplish his purposes in us. Let me wrap this up. What's your foreign land? Go ahead, just say it. What's your foreign land? You may want to type it in the chat. What's your foreign land? I'm not talking about a country. I'm not talking about a, a tourist destination. But what's the place that you're struggling in? I want you to know that you can live out the life that God has called you to live even in that place. COVID-19 or summer skies, you are a servant of Christ and you are a saint, one of God's holy people. Live that out. You live in Christ, not just in Chilliwack. Live that out. You can know grace and you can know peace. Live that out during this difficult time. And you can be confident that he will never stop being at work in your life. And I'm going to ask you to do something that's probably going to make you feel a little uncomfortable, but it's okay. There's nobody there to see you except your own family, okay? I want you to set the chat aside for a few minutes. I would like, you, I would like to ask you to stand with me. I know it's kind of awkward, isn't it? It feels a little strange, doesn't it? But I'd like you to do it anyway. It's okay if you're in your pajamas or your yoga pants or your house coat. It's okay. You can see me, but I can't see you, if that makes you feel better, okay? And this is why I ask it. If we were here in our church, I might do this and ask you to stand and move to the front and we would pay, pray together. But because we're not gathered in the church, I'm going to ask you to do it in your home. And it's a deliberate action step that says, God, I'm serious about this. I'm going to do this in front of my kids, in front of my spouse. I'm serious about this. God, and what we're going to ask him is that he would keep on working in us. I want you to ask God to bring his grace into your life, to be at work in you. I want you to ask him to bring his peace. Maybe you want to stand there just with your palms up. We're going to pray in a second, just in a receptive posture. Say, God, will you keep working in me? I know you've started. You've done some amazing things already. But God, there is so much more. I need God to do so much more in my life. Okay? God, there's so much more that I need you to do some habits I need you to break. There's some disciplines I need you to help me, me uh, implement into my life. There's some things that need to change, God. I'm here, I'm receptive, I'm open. God, would you do that? Let me pray for you, Father in heaven. We come together, standing before you, arms outstretched, looking to you, inviting your Holy Spirit to keep being at work in our life. Never stop working in us, God, we pray. Because God, if you stop working, we have no hope. Because you are at work, we can have hope and we can have confidence to know that what you've started, you will also finish. Holy Spirit, come. And if there's a special area, invite him into that area. The area you, you maybe mentioned earlier. Holy Spirit, come into this part of my life. This is where I really need you to work. Holy Spirit, come. Change me from the inside out. Transform me. Renew me. My mind, my heart, my desires, my attitudes. All of those things. My marriage. My relationships at work. 
God, I need a job. Keep working in my life, God. I need all of these things. I need you to do these things in my life. Thank you, Father, for the confidence that we can have that you who have begun a good work in us will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ's return. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. And we pray that uh, you would just have a great week ahead of you. Amen.